Uh, hello, uh, thanks for coming and thanks for staying here. Um, uh, I'm very happy that you are here, even though I know everyone is waiting for the party, uh, which will be great, but uh, in order to have a great party, uh, we all need uh, some good topics to talk about, and I'm really happy that uh, I can introduce Patrick Tiokorda, who um, has a really interesting uh, talk about peer banking in Bitcoin. So please welcome Patrick. Hello. Hi. Um, it's starting to be funny right from the beginning, probably, because everybody's expecting I will explain the technical details. I'm not a tech person, so <laughs> of the implementation. But I'll, I'll, I'll try my best. If uh, who's the developer here? Okay. I'm just checking who's going to give me hell. But, <laughs> but really, I mean, I'm not a tech guy, although, look, I come from uh, FinTech, where I built uh, two FinTech companies, like payment card companies. And I was normally considered like a, quite technically based, and, but I normally talk to corporations and bankers. So I always was considered, okay, he knows tech. Here, it's quite the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> Most of people in Bitcoin are so technically rooted that I feel like I'm a baby in this, so bear with me. Um, I'll, who was here on the Tomasz's presentation before? Okay, so I can, I can uh, follow on that one. Did you get the replication of a loan and, uh, in futures? That's great, okay. So you're not a f n no longer afraid to take a loan uh, using futures? Right, that's, that's cool. Okay, um, before we go into the technical details, <laughs> um, I think it's um, important to answer actually why we need to do this. And I think this is the, uh, we'll go through why, how, and, uh, and, and what, how to do it. And, and please, I forgot, let's, uh, because it's the last presentation in Hackers Congress, Let's run it like a workshop. If you have a question, there's, there won't be Q&A at the end. Just ask right away. I want to make sure that everybody understands what we're uh, going through, okay? Um, so I think the first key thing is to answer why we actually, what Tomas explained was the financial construct of how you replicate the loan and if, it, if it's possible to be done over Bitcoin. So we know that it can be done, right? And, and we know that it's needed for financialization of Bitcoin, right? But in in uh, in more um, general level, it's important to know why we actually really need it over Bitcoin and not over Ethereum and all that stuff. So um, before we answer that, I I'll try to answer some of the questions that already were raised, like the roles and if it can be scaled up to miners and and hedge funds and institutions, etc. So. Um, imagine this, this is like the uh, drawing on the Paul Rosenberg's um, talk when he said that you should have like this transcendental vision, right? It's like something like, which is like 50 years ago, uh, uh, forward. So this is like really like 20 years forward. That this will not exist tomorrow. We need companies to help us build it, right? But just think about, just try to imagine that uh, the uh, the use case that Tomas described is the Alice and Bob. So Alice goes is replicating the loan uh, because she wants to go leveraged uh, along Bitcoin. She wants more Bitcoin. Then Bob is providing that short liquidity, the the dollar side, right? So Bob is actually any financial institution, hedge fund institution, uh, individual that wants to uh, take his dollars and is searching for an interesting interest and it's okay to hold Bitcoins in his uh, cold wallet. So that's, that's Bob, and there's a lot of use cases for Bob. Then um, Charlie uh, is actually like Bob, but he's not a finance guy. Charlie is a miner, or any business in Bitcoin that need, that's accepting Bitcoin or mining Bitcoin, and instead of selling it right away to pay for electricity and an account in, in dollars, they can play that short side to Alice the same way for an interest. So they basically hedge from Bitcoin to uh, $2 or, or, or any other currency. 
So by this, you can enable any shop or any retailer, anybody that's accepting Bitcoins, to accept Bitcoins and hedge the volatility away, or, or the, the price movements away, and without selling it, and supplying liquidity to the whole ecosystem, which is extremely important concept, because instead of them buying stablecoins, through that utility, they're actually creating stablecoin use case. They're solving stablecoin use case through that utility. So you, you're actually having the benefit of having a stable currency without stablecoins, which is an extreme, extremely important concept here. So that's Charlie. And then um, imagine Dave, which again can be an individual, but most probably it's a professional that knows. Uh, where's Patrick? I saw him here somewhere. That, that's a guy that can do it in scale. Because he knows that there's a lot of demand from Alice's to go uh, long leverage. And there's uh, a lot of dollars on the other side, but they never match. There's always difference. So Dave is ba basically a finance guy that's balancing off that difference between demand and supply in any currency. Because Bob and Charlie can hedge to dollars, but also to euros, uh, francs, and whatever you think about. So there could be a lot of Daves making money, balancing of the liquidity. Um, so once you have that utility that creates on Bitcoin as the underlying any synthetic asset, and you have liquidity that matches, then suddenly the last use case uh, is starting to make sense, and that's Emily, which is basically a derivative trader or any speculator that can use that ecosystem to trade not only pairs paired to Bitcoin, like Bitcoin dollar, Bitcoin euro, etc. But if you take these, if you remember as Tomas was putting the pairs together, if you take Bitcoin dollar and Bitcoin euro and you flip it over and you cancel out a Bitcoin, you're left with dollar euro, which is the most liquid futures market on the planet. So for Emily, transcendental vision 20 years forward, for Emily, it can suddenly become that she has access to financial ecosystem that has Bitcoin as the underlying, but she doesn't have to see it. She doesn't even have to deal with it. She's just trading uh, euro dollar. And that's perfectly possible to achieve without stable coins. So at the end, it's peers, banking peers. At the outskirts of the system, there could be peers studying it, but at the edges of it, where you need a lot of liquidity, there, it, there can be bridges to institutions, which uh, will source probably a lot of liquidity to it. Okay, so this is the like, uh, for us, this is the mental picture, like where this can actually go. This is some, what we just described, this is something which is not possible to do on, or, or is not existent on Bitcoin today. You, you, you can't do it, right? The, on, the only area where this is possible a little bit is over Ethereum and the DeFi projects, but not over Bitcoin. But this is completely different approach how to do it over Bitcoin, okay? So where this thing could live, just a little hint, we'll get back to this, is you have uh, Bitcoin on-chain um, as the key monetary invention we have. And then you have different sediment layers like on-chain, lightning, liquid. And this uh, utility layer, we call it utility layer or accounting layer, it, we think of it like a third layer, but it doesn't have to be a third layer as such. It's, based, it's like an abstract set of rules and tools how you account for the values on the Bitcoin underlying in any of those settlement layers. So there can be different implementations of this over Lightning, different on Liquid, different on on-chain, we'll, we'll get to this. And at one point, they could converge together and create one cohesive ecosystem that goes into different layers. So, so uh, this peer banking concept can live in different layers in a little bit different way, okay? Uh, so it's not a protocol. It's not something we'll write down and publish and everybody will just use it. We want community to actually get to the protocol by building it. Um, so now when you know where, we, where it can go, 
now it's a, it gives us a good base to answer why we actually need it, okay? So Tomas touched on the first one, um, and that's usefulness of Bitcoin. Now everybody is using Bitcoin as a store of value, but may enabling financial products on top of Bitcoin gives you more utility, more usefulness to use Bitcoin as the underlying to have loans, futures, and all that kind of stuff. So Bitcoin suddenly becomes more useful. And this is what a lot of critics of Bitcoin call for, right? Bitcoin's not useful, it's slow, etc. This gives you a lot of utility. So that's the first point. Um, when it's get, out, get more useful, it will attract liquidity. And that's another important thing we need in Bitcoin, is we need more liquidity for this ecosystem to grow, so that the liquidity doesn't go to uh, other uh, altcoins or s somewhere else. We think of uh, boosting liquidity like a vacuum cleaner uh, of fiat. <laughs> yeah, because when that's futures concept, it's we because when you when you buy spot, you have to have you know thousand dollars to buy thousands worth of bitcoins, right? If you want to buy thousands worth of bitcoins you, uh, in futures, you don't have to have that, right? You, you can take ten dollars and buy it. So it's inf it, it's inflating that that balloon and it sucks the fiat liquidity. So the more we do the first one, the, more vac the bigger vacuum cleaner we make for fiat to go into Bitcoin, which is great, <laughs> okay? So, so and when you have more liquidity, you have more robustness and all that stuff. So it, it, it really helps to build the whole thing. Um, so that's the second one. The third one, once you have more utility and more liquidity, then you, by default, help to support the security budget of Bitcoin. Uh, Josef, who's not here, there was a presentation on, on the Hackers Congress on the security budget. That basically means if there's enough subsidy or money for miners to secure the network. So, and the question is, once the subsidy is gone, or getting smaller and smaller, then uh, do they have the motivation to do it? And one of the ways to do it is to increase the utility over Bitcoin. Because the more utility, even though it's played in the upper layers, like a third layer, and not all the time settled on chain where the miners make the fees, the more utility you have there, the more fees ultimately uh, get to the on chain. So you help the, to secure the network, basically, to give miners more, more money. Um, that's a different version. There were, okay. There was a last version of the presentation which had some changes, but it's okay. Um, so these two points should be connected, and that's keeping or maintaining sovereignty, sovereignty uh, which is keeping privacy that you and I had actually that talk about, like KYC, AML, and, on, and that stuff, and self-custody. So privacy, important topic, of course, and if we're able to do this in peer-to-peer -peer manner, be compliant, doesn't mean you have to go through KYC. And we think we know the way, the route, how to actually be compliant without KYC. We think, at least, at, in most of the territories. So, so doing this in peer to peer manner can keep us the privacy, which is an important topic. And getting a loan uh, doesn't mean sending your Bitcoins to BlockFi or BitGo. Uh, what Tomas explained, in whatever swaps uh, you want to enter, your position, you're keeping your Bitcoins in your wallet. Or in, uh, as a margin in multi-sig wallet. So whatever product would be built using this, you're always in full control of your Bitcoins, which is an important thing. So, so that, that's the set of whys, why we actually think this is super important to build our Bitcoin. And we only see very few companies going this direction. One is HODL HODL uh, announced on Honey Badger, something that works with the escrow. So there's a cu couple of companies, but not that much as on e Ethereum. So we think it's super important. Is the why clear? Okay. If you don't remember anything from this presentation, not the tech details and stuff, this is the important stuff. Because the, the why we do stuff, why we do things, that's the most important driver for community to get together and build something. Um, yes. Yeah. Oh shit, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so my question is, you mentioned earlier that all the DeFi applications are being built on Ethereum, uh, with a few exceptions. Um, why is that? What, was this technically infeasible prior to SegWit activation, as an example, or is it purely, uh, I don't know, some cultural reason? Um, I, I see, from my point of view, that, and it's just my point of view, there's two things. One, um, I don't think a lot of people actually recognize the invention of Bitcoin, what it actually is. That's, it's a monetary policy invention. They think of it as a technical invention, right? Once you recognize that, then it doesn't make e any sense to build up a Ethereum, right? And then, if you don't recognize that, a quick shortcut to get something done is Ethereum because it looks just easy to build something on a smart contract, right? Because it's easier to build it, not to build it in a secure way. Like when we started to think about it, we thought, okay, let's build it over Bitcoin. I was like, mm, that's difficult. It's just multi-seek. Uh, how we do it? So it was really, really hard to actually get there. So we started to go through the Ethereum projects to learn how MakerDAO works, how Compound works, how they use the interest rate curves and all that you know, stuff. So, so we learned that. And then uh, uh, Dan Robinson's paper was published in, I think, February or March, which opened us eyes, or Tomas' eyes, because he's the main engineer of this. So how to actually build it over Bitcoin. So it wasn't an e just for us that easy thing like to see how to build it. Um, okay, so we have the why. Now, how much time do we have? Okay, what? Tomas covered a lot of what, and most of you understood the principle of of um, uh, of a loan versus future. So I'll, I'll touch on that very lightly. So basically, the core um, the core building stone to get this done is CFD or uh, contract for difference. We can. We can call it forward contracts or whatever, but basically it's a CFD. It's just like one asset and another asset, and you fix the uh, the other asset in the first one. That's basically it, right? So you take Bitcoin and you fix the other Bitcoin in dollar terms versus the other one, and you account for the difference if the price goes up or price goes down. That's basically very simple. What's important is it's settled in Bitcoin. It's not settled in dollars. It's settled in Bitcoin. So the Bitcoin is the the gold, the underlying which is used to settle it. And once you have that, uh, you can create, as Thomas showed, the synth any basically any synthetic, any asset that has a real world price, we'll get to the price feeds and trustlessness of that, uh, over Bitcoin. And f out of that, you can create the financial products like loans and futures. Okay, so quick example, just conceptually is, um, so these are the variables that you need um, for the contract. In different applications, if it's on-chain and liquid or lightning, this may change, or the, uh, the possibilities could change, but generally this is what you need. So assets, so Alice needs to make a deal with Bob to hedge dollars or euros, or even stocks. So you can, Anything. I mean, any asset that you ha has a real world price. So Emily at the end, you remember the use case of Emily, she will not see Bitcoin and she can trade dollar versus uh, Apple stock. With Bitcoin underlying, completely collateralized. So they uh, agree on the assets and then they pick the sides. So Alice goes long Bitcoin and, um, and Bob or Charlie goes short Bitcoin. Uh, technically, they go long dollar for an interest. Okay, so they agree on the nominal value, like one million worth of futures contract. Uh, they agree on the interest rate, let's say ten percent uh, per annum, and they agree on the price feed. There, and now we're getting into a bit of technical stuff. Um, where we don't, we're not that trustless as we want to. We're trying to be, as it should be trustless as much as it's possible practically to be trustless. So, so let's say in, um, in on-chain implementation, which I'll show you, they will use a, an external price feed from Bitcoin reference rate from CME, for example. So that's a weak point, right? Because it's external, external feed. So you have to find a way how to make it more stable, more trustless or trust minimized in a way. Or in URI's uh, implementation over Lightning, 
uh, you can use DLC contract, discrete lock contracts, where you put all the different price um, levels into the contract, and then once the price is revealed, the contract actually picks it up and uh, distributes the uh, the values. So there's different uh, different ways how to do it, but basically you need a price, and that's that's one one weak weak point. And then um, you actually both sides need to agree on where they get the price yeah. from. So it's not you know the system uses this source, but yeah. if uh, Alice and Bob agree that they're going to use Kraken, they can use Kraken. It's their yeah. choice. Yeah, it can be decentralized to a certain extent or make trust less as to a certain extent. So, but that's the evolution of the whole concept. Um, and then they agree on the duration if it's fixed, if it's really like a futures contract or, or it's perpetual. And they have to then know the mechanisms how to cooperate, basically, to be sure that the margin that is locked in multisig or in, in, in a lightning channel, uh, they can settle, uh, they can add to it, they can withdraw if the other party is not cooperating, etc. But th these are basically the, the key uh, parameters. And we can get to more like implementation detail on the on on the how part, but what do you get from this? And that's a different spin of what Tomas said: is the stablecoin stuff um, that you are creating stablecoins without stablecoins, basically. And I'll, I'll just stop here because it's it's not quite um it's it's not obvious from the uh, start. At least it wasn't to us unless we arrived to that state. Um, so th these are three different stable co types of sta stable coins uh, uh, models, like the fiat backed, uh, like uh, circle coin, or the MakerDAO, let's say, uh, DAI in the, the altcoin backed, and then the uh, backed by Bitcoin. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving out the algorithmic one because that that f that uh, failed completely. So I'm leaving it out. So, and, and there's, these um, characteristics are important for any stablecoin to be stable, right? So you have, what's the backing, uh, how, what type of assets you can actually build on it, uh, the, the trust aspect, the pack, that's an important one, uh, what's the underlying asset and uh, utility, that's another important one, yeah. No, um, what's the... Ba base, base. Base. Base coin. Basis, base so coin, it's yeah. basically simulating a central bank. So if the yeah. price is... Uh, uh, if the peg is broken, then you either raise or uh, lower either supply or interest rates. So that's how you target the price. That's basically what central banks are doing by uh, targeting inflation. Yeah, and yeah, I, I won't get to why they failed, but they actually bumped into regulatory wall basically by creating der derivatives i think right i think that was the angle so here um with the fiat ones so you had the so that uh mo most of you know this right they the the premise is you lock one dollar in a bank and then you issue an erc20 token in the value of one dollar and the premise is, is that it's stable but it's not <laughs> or it's it just can't be stable by default because where they lock the money in a bank. So imagine if the whole world would use those fiat-based or fiat-backed tokens as enormous of money locked in banks. Now, what they do with the money in the bank, they just won't let it lay down, um, have it there with the negative interest rates, right? They, they need to turn over the money. They need to make money on it. So even Circle announced that they, the, all the money that they have in the bank, they will put in AAA plus securities and, and other assets. Now, once they did that step, then the road from AAA to BBB and CCC is just like, it's just a matter of time, right? So by default, it's, it's a fractional stablecoin. It's not stable. It's not collateralized. Run on the bank, easy, here. So it's not stable. Sorry, just picking up on, <laughs> sorry, just that last point that you made about Circle putting all of their coins that they've got in custody in, what, did I miss something there or? No, they, they put the, the collateral, they yeah. put in a bank. The, the, the collateral, the fiat collateral, not the co Yeah, the oh, fiat oh, collateral. Right. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Sorry, yeah. 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 So fiat, uh, probably not that stable. 
Um, altcoins, the, 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 biggest use uh, the, the biggest example is DAI, right, the MakerDAO. Um, there's a couple of issues with this. Uh, although they did an enormous work to bring the industry attention and all this, so, so that's, that's awesome. But the thing is with uh, DAI is, um, I would pick maybe two, or oh, three, okay. So the underlying is ERC20 tokens. It's not a store of value. You have, unless you, if you don't have Bitcoin there, it's, it's end of the game uh, for stablecoin. But, but you can yeah. hedge it using derivatives. Oh yeah, let's do derivatives. Yeah, let's do spaghetti stuff. I mean, you, it, it, if it's not simple, hard, it's, it's just spaghetti stuff. It breaks. <laughs> yeah, you can, but it's, you need this and this and this for this to work. So there's too many woods and coots and it just doesn't work. So that's the first, is the problem is the online. The other problem is the pack. So DAI is just like, a, um, they basically behave like a central bank, right? Artific arbitrary, they're saying, oh, it's 2%, oh, it's 2.5, because they need to keep the pack. But how can you keep the pack manually with arbitrary interest rates on 24-7 market when the market should decide what the interest rate is? That's just nonsense. It has to be algorithmic. And they, they have a lot of problems with this. Um, so if they automate it, that, that's one way to go. But the problem with DAI is the, uh, mainly is the last one is the utility. So they print money, right? And then they search for utility. Like why the peg is moving that widely is because most of the users just take the ethers, lock them up, take the DAI, buy more ether. That means the selling pressure is huge. They're just getting rid of it. That's why all the silos of DAI are not the wallets, are, but are the wallets of um, uh, the exchanges where they just sold the, sold the DAI. So they, lose, they don't have the utility, right? So they search for utility. Whereas here, with this, with this example, it's, it's the other way around. We don't want to solve the stablecoin use case. But through utility, Alice needs a loan, the building stone of finance, and Bob wants to supply the liquidity. So you start with, with utility, with the use case, with some need, and as a byproduct, you get a stablecoin. So you don't have to search for utility, you start with utility, and the stablecoin is just a, a, a natural byproduct of it. So with the Bitcoin approach, uh, as, we, as we're describing here, you don't have to solve utility. You, you cannot get the stablecoin without a utility. Can you clarify? Um, for the recording. Just so I, I make sure I understand. So with the way that would actually look, then we're not saying an actual stablecoin. We're saying there's some button in your wallet that you know initiates some kind of trade that locks the value. Do I understand this correctly? Yeah. OK, cool. It's just you have bitcoins in your wallet, and you say, okay, I want to fix it in dollars. And if the market is working and there's enough liquidity, then you uh, instantly find a counterparty that you match with. But you lock it in, in, in dollars, or then you can switch it to euros, uh, etc. But the only real asset is the bitcoin under. There's no tokens, no stable coins you have to buy to have the exposure or, 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 or to hedge. Um, so that's the utility. Then underlying is Bitcoin, the only store of value. That's easy. Uh, PEC is maintained basically by consensus. So it's, it's no artificial interest rate. It's basically a consensus on a price. Okay? Um, it's trustless and you can have any assets on top of it. So we think it's quite superior to it. Though it's difficult to build, but uh, it's, we think it's quite superior. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Can we go forward? Okay, we have okay, 10 minutes. Okay, how we can build it? Um, now you can give me hell <laughs> with the tech stuff. Okay, settlement. That's the... Uh, Main, okay, so there's things you shouldn't see because this is an old one, but okay, now you can give me hell. <laughs> but um, so this is like uh, a trade-off uh, slide. So 
if you implement it on different layers, it's basically a trade-off between what the layer, the settlement layer gives you, like the speed and, uh, and cost, versus so that you're able to keep the margin uh, at the appropriate level or withdraw it as, as when you need it, or you can add it fast as, as, as you need it so that the contract stays solvent, basically. So you can, uh, you can implement it on Bitcoin uh, on-chain, which we haven't published yet, but we want to by end of the year, hopefully. <laughs> but we all, we all, yeah, yeah. But by end of the year, we should we should have it uh, published in the updated news, uh, white paper. Uh, on on chain, it's of course expensive, right? So it's for higher value uh, transactions. But for the use case that Tomas uh, showed, uh, going leverage long for the whole bull market, that's exactly it. You building of big position for long term. So paying fees, uh, bigger fees is okay. So you can do it on on-chain. You don't need Schnorr signatures. So you can, you can build it on on-chain. Now, actually, you don't need app for it even. You can, you can do it on paper. So just uh, we can just take a paper and do the uh, contract on paper and meet here next week uh, again on uh, Sunday and, and settle. It's easy. The tech just makes it easy, uh, more easier to do it, but we can re literally make that contract here on paper and it would work. We would just go and open multi-sig account, uh, the multi-sig wallet on, on on-chain, put the margin there, and that's it. We come back here next Sunday and we settle. Um, so that's on-chain. Um, you can do it on liquid, which is basically uh, a different version of, of Bitcoin on-chain which is faster. So for any use cases, like con once they will connect, once uh, Blockstream will connect more um, exchanges, it can be used in situations like maybe institutions, like uh, Patrick was asking, like where you need huge volumes transferred quickly, entered into a contract quickly, that could be on Liquid. And then you have Lightning, which uh, you already published some paper on, uh, and that's an interesting one because it's the most capital effective and cost effective option. You should be online in most of the cases, but it gets us to an interesting as long term aspiration when where the whole thing could actually go. That's it's really cool. So you have different settlement options how does the contract settles. So the on chain, uh, the on chain implementation is pretty straightforward. So you have the CFD with all these uh, parameters, the nominal value and uh, et cetera. So you put that into the app. And then the app opens you, or you do it manually, a multi-sig wallet on chain um, where you fund the margin. Uh, and there's another weak point, except the price feed, and that's it needs to be arbitrated, right? So if either party stops cooperate, uh, for whatever reason, you need to be able to access your funds, right? So you need to, um, to have an arbiter. What HODL HODL is doing, for example, they are they are the arbiter. We're thinking of different concept than where you have a, like a federation of arbiters. So it's more decentralized. You can be sure that uh, think of like a federation of arbi um, of arbiters like you know, Trezor, Casa, Blockstream, and all the big guys in, in crypto, which you trust. And you can be sure that when they run the arbitrary arbiter software, it runs, it does its job, uh, and they know how to how to keep it running, right? So this this is what you need. And you can be sure if one fails, there's you know five or six different ones. Um, yeah. So you have the multisig, you have let's say this arbitrary uh, arbiter uh, um, network, and that actually gives you. Uh, basic, a very simple smart contract um, over Bitcoin. Also, I would add that the other way how to do it without arbiter on chain is using discrete lock contracts, which you can do on Bitcoin on chain as well. Might be more expensive because you need to settle like every week or every month, or uh, but you can get yeah. rid of the, the arbiter, you can use DLCs, and you can do it today because there are DLC implementations as well. Yeah. But this, it, it's very, it, it's easy to understand this because this, it's quite analogical from traditional finance, right? You have like a batches, a batched product like duration, and this, so that's easy. When you go to Lightning, that that that's starting to get 
pretty cool because then uh, lightning is, uh, can be continuous settlement. So you can settle in seconds. There's different implementations of it. Uh, Uri was working on uh, not continuous settlement, but settlement with DLC, the uh, discrete lock contracts. But basically in uh, lightning, you can get to a stage once you have enough liquidity where, whereby um, Alice and Bob can, with the flick of a finger, switch or hedge from dollar to euro. It's like Spotify over BitTorrent sort of a thing. It's, the implications of this are huge because in tra traditional finance is bound by transaction cost and speed. Here, it's marginalized. The, there's almost no cost and the speed is lightning. So here you can actually get to almost like uh, f like loans without uh, credit default risk because it's continually settled every second. It's really interesting where this could go. Of course, the road to get there is just it's really long, but the the ultimate um, the the ultimate picture which you can think about is just enormous, right? Um, but uh, I would, uh, if you're interested in, in Lightning implementation, there is going to be a link to URI's implementation with Lightning combined with DLC contracts, which is not continuous, right? It's it's not continuous settlement. It is until uh, the the other party disappears, and when they do, you have to settle at a right. certain time. Uh, but uh, it's continuously settled until there's a dispute, and then it's settled on chain, right. which is not continuous. Okay. So that's lightning. Um, we don't have liquid because uh, that's blockstream part <laughs> to do. <laughs> um, but it would be like on-chain basically. But you can also have combinations like uh, you can combine these uh, options. Uh, challenges, that's uh, important one. Uh, which we actually see now. There might be of course different challenges but I would like to address this that not only as challenges, but the flip side of a challenge is also always opportunity, right? So we think that solving for companies that would like to join this, solving these challenges gives you the opportunity to maybe monetize uh, the whole thing. So first one is uh, discovery and matching. So imagine the contract between the Alice and Bob, they can write it on paper here or they can use the app. The trouble becomes when Bob says, okay, I'm done, halfway through the contract, and he disappears. Now, Alice is left with, uh, you know, leverage long position and she doesn't have the, uh, the dollars, right? So she ideally would need not even to know that Bob's gone because he's immediately replaced by somebody else. So there's, and that gives you need to have liquidity and discovery. So that discovery can be automatic, uh, decentralized, and that's the difficult part of it, to do it in a trustless, de decentralized way so that you don't have a centralized order book. So that peers can find each other. So discovery, and it's different in Lightning, and it's different on-chain. So, But on-chain, we thought like, okay, easy discovery, uh, Telegram channel. <laughs> Just discovery of peers that want to do business, and then you take the app, and then you, uh, you can enter into the contract. Uh, have you checked AirSwap way of uh, doing it? It's uh, for Ethereum. You have an order book, lo uh, local order book, and you connect, uh, you have a local server, and uh, you just uh, send the information to their server. Or right now, it's I believe it's uh, centralized, but uh, maybe they will decentralize it. And it broadcasts to the, ne to the Ethereum network. Maybe, I, do I don't know, something like that. I can answer that. So we have been thinking about many models. Uh, so if you do it on top of Lightning Network, uh, you have peers that you're connected to, so you can do network discovery. Basically ask your peers. If they cannot provide liquidity, they can ask others and make a fee. So it's the same model as how you discover channels and, and peers uh, and how you route payments actually. So that's one option. The problem with this approach of a centralized server is uh, that they can be regulated, so so we would like to avoid 
any you know uh, server that provides an order maybe there's a business opportunity for someone doing it in a centralized way i personally think it's a bad idea to even try because they will regulate it right away and then you have to fill fill Yes, exactly. And um, there's also a global way um, uh, by announcing it. So you can you can say, okay, uh, there will be an order book, uh, but we will collect it in a decentralized way. So in a way, uh, we create a peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, but it will kind of converge on one order book. So that's another way to do it. I don't know what's the best way right now, but uh, thankfully we have... A, options to choose from, not, uh, not you know, uh, waiting for someone to figure it out. So if no one figures it out, we will pick one way and try that one. Thanks. So yeah, that, there was discovery and matching. Now liquidity sharing is very uh, closely connected to scale, and that's an important topic. So once Bob goes away, he needs to be replaced by somebody. Or if Alice wants to have a bigger position than Bob has uh, his funds for, then the position could be compiled from two peers or three peers. So you need to be able to root liquidity. Rooting anything in Lightning has its challenges. You know, rooting it on-chain has its challenges. So there's, there's a lot of things to do to do a simple thing like rooting liquidity and sharing it across the network in a decentralized manner. But it can be done. There's a, read the paper on the Lightning. That's interesting for that too. It's doable, but you need to then... Um, we think the best way, and that's why we're, we'll be releasing all the papers open source, um, to get the community build it and figure out the best way how to, how to do it. And then once the, once the best models will crystallize, then also the monetization models will crystallize. But we need more brains. Uh, to get this done. So liquidity sharing and scaling, very important thing. Uh, we actually, one of the liquidity scaling options, we thought like to suck liquidity, the, the vacuum cleaner, we thought like, okay, we'll connect it to BitMEX. <laughs> yeah, because BitMEX is Dave uh, use case, right? He knows the stuff and there's a lot of Daves on BitMEX. <laughs> well, they know derivatives, they know, they know everything. So we thought like, okay, so this is the pipe. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll just grow it like, like trees on BitMEX. So th it's still alive, this idea, but it could work. And, but then you, ha you can have more of these like entran entrance points, how to suck the liquidity into, into, this, in, into the system. Um, so so, that's so what, what I like about it is you can have specialization and you can have people who have a, a, a brokerage account, for example, and they, mm -hmm. they can sell you stock and make yeah. money on their, yeah. on their fees. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so you really, uh, uh, people can specialize yeah, in being case. Dave's and, uh, yeah. and actually making money just by providing yeah. access to the liquidity that they have access to. So. And it's really powerful. A lot of hodlers are Alice's, right? They need dollar liquidity. Now, if you really uh, plug it to BitMEX for all the days, now there's dollar liquidity. <laughs> and these guys know how to hedge, right? So very natural for them. And then, okay, so and the third one is the price and arbiter trustlessness. We touched on that. So we need to be, a, that's a super important point when you go decentralized because everything what's decentralized is made for the environment where people don't, don't trust each other. So uh, even a federation of five or six is it's better, but it's not, it's, it's not there. So, so that, that point is probably the weakest part of everything, like the price feeds and, and, and arbiters, or solving how to do the disputes. If you need an arbiter or not, in different implementations, you don't even know, need the arbiter. Um, so that's the third one. Fourth one, uh, I think somebody mentioned compliance here or, or regulations. That's an important one, but uh, of course, nobody know, we don't have a crystal ball what's going to happen. I just read two days ago that FCA in UK wants to regulate open source software. Developers. Yeah. R yeah, read it out. Yeah. S FCA in UK. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, it's a, it's a, in this concept, it's quite tricky. Um, when you... And, 
Drawing on my fintech experience, we've done a lot of work with lawyers and I spend a lot of talks to Czech national banks. So regulation is just uh, it's a no-go thing, but <laughs> oh, it's everywhere the same. It's everywhere the same. No regulation. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think for this ecosystem to grow, it's not just about not being compliant. We can be compliant, but that doesn't mean we have to use KYC in different models. Most of them cannot be monetized then, <laughs> because if you charge for something, you're in a different position. But if you stay in peer-to-peer -peer mode, if you go as much trustless and decentralized as you can, if you solve the issue of actually creating derivatives, it's like one key here is if I enter with URI into a derivative contract on paper here right now, and we come here next week and settle, it's a derivative contract, but nobody can regulate us. If we code an app, open source, he downloads it, I download it, and instead of a paper, we just put it into the app, and we meet here next week again. Oh, actually, we don't have to. Maybe if, if we connect it somehow. Nobody can regulate us. There's no KYC AMR. If you multiply this to a network, can't be regulated. When you start um, uh, sharing and transferring, uh, rerouting liquidity, and you make it a business, eh, it's a different thing. Okay. So th there are points where you ha you're closer or further from regulation. So you. But there is a way, most probably, how to do as much as you can without the KYC AML. And on the outer edges of it, where there's going to be a lot of liquidity, like from institutions, there could be bridges where part of that ecosystem is actually regulated through KYC AML and part not. It, it's not mutually exclusive, these two. They can live together, most probably. So it's the fourth one. And yeah, and figuring, figuring out the business model, how to make money. Uh, it's difficult and in, in more difficult probably in, on uh, over Bitcoin ecosystem, but uh, we believe that these pa at least these pain points actually give you opportunity how to monetize it, how to solve those things. Once you, it's very valuable for the whole ecosystem. Once it's valuable, you can charge for it. Okay. Um, yeah, and we're on time. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so, do we have time for questions? Didn't check. Uh, hopefully, a few questions. Yes. I, I admit I don't fully understand it, so this might be a silly question. But do you imagine separate iterations of this having their own varying interest rates, or would it be standard across the entire uh, ecosystem? No, it's 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 um, it's not it's, it's not a platform. It's not a protocol. It's uh, wait here. So I do a contract with URI with 10% uh, PA with you uh, for dollars. Mm -hmm. With you, uh, I'll do because I need um, I don't know francs, and you value it more. You give me 15%. I'm fine with this. If, if every contract, every peer relationship can have a different interest rate, and and aggregate the whole market will reveal a market interest rate then, which you will then look. Probably look in the apps. Okay, it's eight, so I'll do eight point five or something. So, market will decide. It's 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 not set by the protocol, or by this. You said about the uh, collateral. Uh, what what percent? Uh, I mean, on Ethereum with yeah. this in Dai is one hundred twenty-five percent. It's yeah. it's not workable. Same like this. If I enter with uh, URI, uh, Bitcoin dollar and we agree on 30% collateral, and I'm fine with this because I know that the, it will cover the volatility if the market goes against him and I want to be sure that I get the collateral, I'm fine with 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 uh, the colleague over there. We can say, okay, that's, that's a different story. We go 45, the same thing. Every contract will have it in a different way, and in aggregate, the market will reveal uh, the, 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 the market standard. Uh, yeah. What is important here is that if you run out of collateral, you get kicked out of the contract and you need to find another peer. So there's no risk, uh, there's not a lot of risk if you continuously yeah. settle, for example. Um, if you are just are losing collateral and then you run out of it, then goodbye, your position is closed and I find another peer to open the position. So it's not as important. It's uh, it's the same in uh, uh, in decentralized derivative markets yeah. like BitMEX, you know, 
you there's probably one percent requirement or something like yeah. that but you know if you run out of it then then you need to either uh, put more or or get kicked out yeah uh, what about uh, liquidations when uh, in the contract when contracts uh, is going against uh, one of the peers uh, and there's not enough collateral to to fund the opposite side uh, yep. what's then so it's a very good question different implementation different implications very different i guess if let's say we're in the on chain uh, implementation then and we come here with uri uh, next sunday then i know okay bitcoin can move 20% or 30% so my minimum would be okay i need 50% of the collateral unless uh, uh, to do business with with uri so um his um motivation is to keep the collateral at a level, not at the minimum level, but at the level that the contract stays because he wants to go long Bitcoin, right? So he wants to be exposed to it. Of course, it can happen that the market's faster and there's not enough uh, collateral. So here in on-chain, you either have there enough or you have to have ability to get to that remaining collateral as fast as you can. And that's the trade-off which I had here is Every layer gives you different speed and different cost. And, and these will uh, influence the concrete implementation here and the level of the collateral. While on Lightning, if we do continuous settlement, the collateral could be just super small. Because and the more liquidity you have... Yeah, you're you, covering one second exactly. price movement, so that's... Not, not a week. So in the on-chain, I would have to have a lot. In, in, in uh, Lightning, I would just have a little. And if there's mo more peers and enough liquidity, I know that if he doesn't deliver the margin, I'm instantly switched to somebody else and you en re-enter the contract with somebody else. So a different implementation is a different implication to margin. Um, thank you. Uh, okay, maybe a last question. Just a short, but not the simple. Uh, and I don't know who I should direct the question. <laughs> technical, <laughs> because, uh, so. Yes, technical. <laughs> uh, is there um, perhaps early codes that I can play with for uh, on-chain contracts? No. Thanks. Uh, well, for DLCs, there is uh, there is the um, uh, implementation of discrete law contracts uh, uh, from the MIT lit, so you can play with that. It's not for derivatives, though, but you can uh, you can write your own price oracle which distributes the funds, and it's quite easy to get there if you if you want. Um, okay, so. Uh, yeah, this is uh, contact information for Patrick. That we have a white paper and uh, everything. What I really like uh, about uh, uh, spending time with these two guys <laughs> is that uh, they have a very interesting vision and uh, I think we can build it and it will be very useful. So, uh, so the more I dig into it, I, I see uh, a very nice light at the end of the tunnel, so it's not just uh, um, uh, you know getting rich fast, but uh, but you can uh, build some useful stuff uh, stuff on top of Bitcoin, and uh, so that's very exciting for me. And um, uh, if you're interested, I hope you uh, join the project. And uh, now I think uh, I should invite you. Um, uh, to the closing speech and the party. So thank you, Patrick, uh, for your uh, interesting talk. And uh, I think we're finished in this room for now.